For by sorceries, by drugs, were all nations deceived. Not even the debauchery of Rome and Greece can rival the depths to which modern man has fallen to feed the greatest scourge of our time, addictions. From liquor, to drugs, from gambling, to sex. Never before has Satan's grip been so powerful. Never before have these tools of deception been so tempting, so available, so destructive. Join doctors Jack and Rex Sullivanapi as they search God's word for the truth about addictions. Oh, and friends, my heart is so moved by that opening because never before have we needed to address a problem worldwide like we need it right now, the problem of addictions. It's not isolated here in the United States and Canada. It is worldwide. I just thank God so much for the way that he has led us to do this for you. Because I was in my office here in our headquarters and Jack came running in and he said, you know, we've been praying about what God wanted us to do for the next video for our people. And he said, I know what it is. It's the subject of addictions. And I said, great. That sounds wonderful. What a need out there. And so he came in. It was a taping day. He came in uh, to our studio and he uh, shared it with our crew and then laid around with our staff. And Jack, I just thank God for the way he has led you. I ran into the crew. I said, God just gave me the answer for the next video. It's addictions. And then the Holy Spirit really confirmed that we were to do this because in the following week, there was almost a full page ad in USA Today and in the Wall Street Journal about the 14 part HBO series on addiction. And I said, all right, Lord, we're going to run with this. The series was absolutely great by HBO on addiction. It was probably the most complete look at addiction that has ever come to the screen. And I want you to take a look at this wonderful, wonderful ad. Why can't they just stop addiction? New knowledge, 10 testaments, new hope. And you know, they have new treatments now for this addiction around the world. This is the ad that we saw in the Free Press, Addiction, a 14-part series by H. Be all. How wonderful to know that they are finding new treatments. But we're going to be talking a little more in depth as to why people become addicted to anything. But before I go on, I'd like uh, to ask Jack, I think people are really more or less sick of where the world is going right now, don't you, Jack? Oh, Rexella, I have a tremendous article from Mona Janian's book on world events, and she says, we are sick. Listen to her. We are sick of a sex-sowed, violence-ridden film and entertainment industry that portrays every base act of human nature as normal behavior. We are sick of the so-called experts spewing out psychological nonsense that excuses every act of personal irresponsibility because of some painful childhood experience. We are sick of career politicians who stand for nothing but re-election. We are sick of radical judges who refuse to process convicted criminals promptly. We are sick of corporate greed that is selling out America for a buck while forbidding even the mention of Christmas. And concludes it with, we are sick of career hungry television talk show hosts who are getting rich off sleaze that dignifies indecency, vulgar, violent lyrics set to loud, obnoxious noise called music. I think a lot of people are wondering right now, well, you know, I might do some of the things you're going to be talking about. I'm not addicted. Have you ever looked that word up in the dictionary, friends? Let me give you the meaning of addiction. It's a compulsive need for use of a habit-forming substance that is harmful to one's body. To devote or surrender oneself to something habitually or obsessively. 
In other words, they can't help it. They have to have it. Well, let me go on, and we're going to take these uh, addictions one at a time. I'm so very, very thankful that I have a friend, Dr. Kathleen Norton, who is an internist, one of the finest, I think, in Michigan. And she's at Beaumont Hospital, and we had a deep conversation about addictions. And I said, I'd like to pick your brain, Dr. Norton. And she said, I'd be happy to help out, Rexel, any time. So I said, off the top of your head, give me three of the most prominent addictions that you deal with in your office. And she said, number one, tobacco, number two, alcohol, and number three, cocaine. Right off the top of her head, number one, number two, number three. First of all, I'd like to show you before I ask Jack a question about tobacco. We're going to deal with that right now. Tobacco label, big killer of this century. Health officials say that the drug will be linked to a billion deaths. If current trends hold, tobacco will kill a billion people worldwide this century. And how does tobacco deliver its effects? There are more than 4,000 chemicals found in the smoke of tobacco products. Of these, nicotine, first identified in the early 1800s, is the primary reinforcing component of tobacco that acts on the brain. Oh my, when you pick up that first cigarette, you don't think it's going to affect your brain or that you will become addicted, do you? Certainly not. Jack, uh, somebody came up to you the, not too long ago, and uh, they said, uh, if I smoke, will I go to heaven? And you gave a very, very good answer. I liked it. I said, yep, and sooner. Right. <laughs> now, many of the addictions about which we'll talk today have to do with one's eternal destiny. I don't believe that tobacco does. We've had some of the great ministers of the past who smoked at the Moody Bible Institute when they had their conventions. They had G. Campbell Morgan. And after he got through preaching for the week, they had to fumigate the rooms because of the heavy tobacco smoke. And then, of course, there was Spurgeon in England, that great Baptist preacher. And he continued the smoke until one day he passed a drugstore and he saw a big sign in the window that said, the brand that Spurgeon smokes. And he got under such conviction that was the end of it. Donald, Gray, Barnhouse, and others. It's not a good thing. Why? Because we defile God's temple, our bodies. You know, a lot of people go to church and say, oh, the holy temple of God. Wait a minute. Acts 7, 48 says, The Most High God dwells not in temples made with hands. Acts 17, 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. It's not the building that's important in God's sight. It's God's people, for they are His temples. Proof, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, You are God's building. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17, he says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So this is the temple, and this is the temple that should be kept clean for our Lord. And I'll tell you, smoking's a terrible thing. It causes cancer of the lips, of the mouth, of the tongue, of the throat, and of the lungs. Do you know that 440,000 people in the USA alone die every year from tobacco? That's more than the combined number through alcohol, heroin, Cocaine, murder, suicide, uh, crashes by cars, and AIDS combined. Mm -hmm. It's a deadly thing. And then let's take into account somebody else that is affected by cigarettes. Those who never smoke. They never smoked. My aunt, bless her heart, 
Never smoked a day in her life. A wonderful, wonderful lady. Died at the age of 63, secondhand smoke. And I'd like for you to take a look. You know, the research backs us up. The study shows outdoor smoke gets in your lungs, sitting within two feet of the source, is enough to put health at risk. Now, people may inhale high levels of secondhand smoke even on outside patios and sidewalk cafes. Now, this is a new study. Mothers, Think about your babies when you're sitting there smoking while they're eating. The debate is over. Surgeon General makes the case that secondhand smoke kills. Take a look at this cartoon. Now let's see you quit. Nickel Boost. And of course, that's the tobacco company speaking. Quitters always win on this 30th anniversary. The Great American Smokeout provides even more help in kicking cigarettes. And you know, smoking, I don't care if it's secondhand or if it's in your mouth, is endangering your life and the lives of those around you. And Jack, this is a serious business, isn't it? Oh, it really is, Rexella. I called my brother the other night. I knew that Don started smoking when he was in the Air Force. And so I asked ask him a very direct question. I said, I hope you don't mind that I quote you. Absolutely not. I said, when did you quit smoking? He said, when I got cancer. When I got cancer. And then he followed it up with this. And let me tell you something else, Rexella. I would love to have a cigarette right now. But Jackie's not going to do that. Thank the Lord, he's not going to do that. But you know, you went to the hospital to talk to a gentleman, oh, much uh, worse than my brother. And uh, you had an experience that you told me you'll never forget. He was lying there gasping for air because he had had cancer of the throat and lungs. And they had to make a hole in his trachea so that he could get air into his system. And so he was gasping and gasping. And when I asked him if he wanted to meet Jesus, he said, I'm not interested. But he said, there's one more thing I want before I die. Would somebody stick a lighted cigarette into this hole in my neck so that I can have one more smoke? God help us. Don't even start. Just say no. No, thank you. Well, here are some other addictions that Jack mentions in one of his books. And I'd like you to take a look, please, as we read them. Ten million inebriates drink themselves into insensibility on a daily basis. Another 10 million Americans are abusing drugs. Sexual promiscuity is being condoned and even encouraged by government and judicial action. Pornography is a multi-billion dollar industry. Millions of children are now born out of wedlock, many to girls as young as 11. Murder now claims the lives of 50,000 Americans a year. Cybersex on the internet and a proliferation of online pornography bring triple X rated material into millions of our homes where children are logging on to evil. I would like to ask Jack a question. So often we refer to many of these things as diseases. And this is a very, very important question, I think. Are all of them, are any of them really diseases? Or are they against religious and moral laws and a transgression of God's word? The participants really don't care about what God wants them to do. They want it. They want their well done. And therefore, Jack, is it really a disease? Or could we call it a sin? I'm not going to be politically correct. I'm going to stand on the Word of God. I am tired of all this psycho babble that calls everything that man does against his body a disease. God never punishes anyone because they have cancer, tuberculosis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, but He does punish those who practice the things you just read from one of my books. Now, what does God call these things? And why do they happen? Job 4, verse 8, They that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Galatians 6, 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. The 
Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, and that's the second death, the lake of fire. 1 Corinthians 15, 34, awake to righteousness and sin not. 1 Timothy 5, 22, be not partakers of other men's sins. 1 Timothy 5, 24 says some men's sins are open beforehand. They get exposed. Other men, they follow after the judgment day. But I've got good news for you. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. And he sent his son to die for every sin imaginable. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for our sin. 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sin in his own body on the tree. Unto Christ who loved us and washed us from our sin in his own blood, Revelation 1, 5. Now, what do you have to do? Can you really be cleansed? 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Rexella, He not only forgives them, but He forgets we ever committed them. For Hebrews 8, verse 12, and chapter 10, verse 17, God speaking says, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So though these addictions are sin, He's willing to cleanse and forgive us forever. I love it. Don't you love that? In fact, God gave the laws telling us not to do certain things, not to make us unhappy. But He knew that if we did these things, we would be unhappy. That I've never met an alcoholic yet that was happy or somebody who is addicted to cigarettes that really want to be addicted. He knows that these things are not good for us and will not make us happy. But, whoo, that forgiveness, isn't that wonderful? Well, you know, friends, many desperate attempts uh, to cope with the grim problem of drug abuse continues to grow. And so we are going to be talking about drugs here in just a moment. Drug trafficking appears to be unrestrained. I'll tell you, we've really lost that battle. And the abuse is not limited, friends, to illegal drugs. Um, but over-the-counter uh, medications and sometimes drugs in uh, the cabinet is something that your youngsters will go and get. Take a look at this. The dangerous new high. Teenagers are stealing drugs from your medicine cabinet and sharing them with friends, sometimes with deadly consequences. Now today we are not going to be dealing with prescription drugs. If someone has put you on a prescription, your doctor is saying you need this. That's not what we're talking about here today, is it, Jack? Oh, absolutely not. But on the other hand, there are young people who are taking the prescription drugs that their parents take and overdosing on them. That's when it becomes sin. It's just what happened to Anna Nicole Smith an overdose. Jack gave me something that uh, really impressed me from the HBO series. And I'll tell you, friends, we need to take this very seriously. In total, the 2005 National Survey on Drug Use and Health estimated that 22.2 .2 million Americans aged 12 and older suffer from dependence on or abuse of drugs and alcohol. Did you read that? Addiction is America's number one public health crisis. Last year, 150,000 Americans died as a direct result of chemical addiction. More than half of young people with a substance abuse diagnosis also have a diagnosable mental illness. I'm going to go on here. Uh, Jack, uh, before I do, uh, this is an international problem. So I need to ask Jack something from the Bible here. Does the Bible address drugs directly? Oh, many, many times. But what do we mean by drugs that will doom a person eternally if he takes them just to get on a high? We're talking about cocaine, heroin, marijuana, LSD, ecstasy, and the young people have a lot of terms that I've collected here. Meth heads, junkies, potheads, speed freaks, acid heads, hypes, pill heads, cokies, cube heads, and hop heads. They pop, snort, or drop yellow jackets, 
acid, snow, purple hearts, barbs, weed, bounding powder, smack, Mary Jane, red devils, speedball, happy dust, goofballs, rainbows, dexies, reefers, blue velvet, and bennies. They speak of bags, roaches, bindles, sleigh rides, fixes, tracks, blanks, decks, blasts, flashes, and being strung out. What a mess, Rexel. Let's go on. I'd like to read to you a couple of other things that we want to share. Drugs and alcohol change the brain. They change its structure and how it works. Are you amazed at that? College drug use and binge drinking on the rise. Prescription abuse is also on the rise. Illicit drug use rising among baby boomers. Pot growing moves to the suburbs. Illegal marijuana growers turning hot real estate into hot houses. One in five adults have a close relative who is or was addicted to drugs or alcohol. In Tim Ryan's family, he is the addict. And as I said, oh, this is a worldwide problem. Columbia cracks down on drug cash. From Jane's Intelligence Digest, Ukraine as a heroin route. Again, from the Digest, Georgia's trafficking challenge. And I believe that every single minister or priest or rabbi should be warning their people and getting into those pulpits and saying it's wrong. God doesn't want this in your life. Uh, Jack, it's a worldwide problem, as I said. The term sorcery appears 27 times in the Bible. 22 times it means control by evil spirits. But every time you see the term sorcery, it doesn't always mean that. It means it 22 times, five times it does not because the word sorcery should not have been in the five texts I'm about to give you. In the Greek New Testament, it is pharmakia. The Spanish say pharmacia. And we see it over every drugstore. Pharmacy. Now, where are these texts? First of all, Revelation 18, 23. For by pharmakia, drug abuse, were all nations deceived. It's here right now, Rex. You just read from Ukraine and Georgia, and they are members of the former Soviet Union. Every nation on earth is now affected, and it's one of the last signs before Jesus returns. That's why we know His coming is right at the door. Now, during the tribulation hour of Revelation chapter 6 to 18, it gets worse. And God is sending judgments upon the earth, 21 of them. And here's why. Revelation 9, 21. They would not repent of their murders, their pharmakia, drug abuses, their sexual escapades, and their thefts. Now, what happens to those who are hooked on drugs and never repent of it? And let me say this right now. I'm not saying this. God wrote it. I only quote it. Don't get mad at me. Here you'll see the terms again in both texts, sorceries. But it's incorrect. It should be pharmakia drug abuse. Revelation 21, 8, the fearful and unbelieving and abominable or whoremongers and murderers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Revelation 22, 15, outside of heaven are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Now in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, it mentions many sins, but number six there is witchcraft. Again, it's Fadimachiah, drug abuse. And so Paul says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And one of them is Fadimachiah. And then he ends in verse 21 by saying, of the which I tell you before, as I now tell you again, that they which do such things shall not, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is the book. God wrote it. Now, what should you do? Repent. And when you come to Jesus for that cleansing power and get washed in the blood of the Lamb, something wonderful happens. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God hath made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 
when you come and receive Christ, there's a change. You are a new creation. Ephesians 2, 1 says, You with He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. Now, for you who say you're believers, but you're hooked on these things, Ephesians 5, 18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because when He is in control, you no longer practice these fleshly habits. Galatians 5, 16, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, I'm trying to give you good news after every point. Oh, yes, Jack, you know, that's twice now. Well, already Jack has told us that no matter what we've done, the Lord will forgive and He will forget. When Jesus ascended into heaven, He didn't leave us alone. No, He gave us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us and to give us the power to overcome those temptations. Well, we're going to be dealing now with some of the drugs. We've named the problem of drug abuse the number one drug in America and around the world. Do you know what it is? Alcohol. Yes, alcohol is a drug. It's a drug. Over 50 million Americans depend on alcohol. And take a look at this. One half million, yes, one half million are between the ages of 9 and 12. We spend $90 billion a year on booze, and $5.5 billion is spent by students. Alcohol is involved in one half of all U.S. driver fatalities, and 40% of all industrial fatalities, and 47% of all industrial injuries. This drug, I think you will agree, friends, is carving out disastrous consequences. This drug, maybe you're addicted, but I'm going to ask Jack if he would read to us something that he uh, got not too long ago, and it's a statement by Dr. Uh, Cease, and a powerful statement it is. He was a new Lutheran minister, wasn't he, Jack? Yes, and I got it out of my book, Sin's Explosion. And he was one of the great Lutheran theologians of the 19th century. And here was a man in Europe who preached against liquor because we now hear, well, they drink in Europe. All these denominations. Yes, because there hasn't been a man like this great Lutheran minister and theologian, Dr. Cease, who spoke out. We need this kind of preaching. This is unbelievable. Joseph Cease, an outstanding Lutheran theologian of the 19th century, gives the following commentary on biblical text concerning booze. The history of strong drink is the history of ruin, of tears, of blood. It is perhaps the greatest curse that has ever scourged the earth. It is one of depravity's worst fruits, a giant demon of destruction. Men talk of earthquakes, storms, floods, conflagrations, famine, pestilence, depetition, and war. But intemperance in the use of intoxicating drinks has sent a volume of misery and woe into the stream of the world's history. It is an evil which is limited to no age, no continent, no nation, no party, no sex, no period of life. It has taken the poor man at his toil and the rich man at his desk, the senator in the halls of state and the drayman on the street, the young man in his festivities and the old man in his repose, the priest at the altar and the layman in the pew, and plunge them together into a common ruin. Thank God for this man. Oh, Jack, that is a tremendous statement. So very, very true. Well, let's see what he is talking about from the headlines. The United States of Wine, the race to become the next Napa Valley is on. Treat binge drinking as a drug problem. This just in. The use of illegal drugs by young people declined again last year. That's got to be a relief to parents. But what about underage drinking, which remains about the same? Parents should be equally concerned about this stubborn trend. From the Globe and Mail, from Canada, the crisis that never came in the 1990s. Experts warned that damaged children born to addict moms would overwhelm social systems. Now science finds exposure to cocaine may wreak less havoc than alcohol, 
that's right, or even tobacco. Hopeful news for families who yearn to turn their lives around. Wow, that's yes. hard to believe. Alcohol does more damage than what they were worried about concerning drugs. Yes, that's hopeful. And tobacco. Too. Absolutely. All right, let's go on. If 12 fully loaded jumbo jets crashed every year, something would be done about it. Now listen, every year nearly 6,000 teens die in car crashes. Again, grape juice may protect heart as well as wine. I want you to take a look at who said this. William Shakespeare, O thou invisible spirit of wine, if thou hast no name to be known by, let us call thee a devil. O God, that men should put an enemy in their mouths to steal away their brains. Amen. Going on here, alcohol and your brain. Everyone knows that heavy drinking can cause brain psychological damage. New evidence indicates that even the moderate imbiber may incur some loss or replaceable brain cells. Unbelievable. Teens who have five or more dinners a week with their families are less likely to try marijuana smoke cigarettes, or drink alcohol. Family relationships. Well, you know, Jack, the important thing is not so much that we are encouraging people because of what will happen to your brain or so forth, but what does God have to say about alcohol? He doesn't say, don't do this because he wants us to be unhappy, because he knew the physical effects that alcohol would have upon us. So he now says, don't do it for a definite reason. What does he say about it, Jack? Well, I'm going to vent my anger on these social drinkers within Christianity. The Bible is opposed to it, is against it. You know, there are three billion souls within various religions today who will not touch booze. One billion Hindus, one billion Buddhists, and one billion Muslims. Who does all the drinking? Who are the guzzlers? The Christians. And I'll tell you, I get angry about this. I read not long ago where they had a Holy Ghost cocktail party in California where they gathered together to get the gifts of tongues after they were full of booze. You don't get it because you're going to see that the Holy Spirit who wrote this book constantly speaks against this and he gives the Spirit to them that obey him. And when you hear these texts, you'll know whether you're obeying or not. Now, the, I'm going to go slowly because this is a heavy Bible lesson. There is the word yayin in the Hebrew and oinus in the Greek. And it can mean either grape juice or wine. How does one know? Professor Moses Stewart said, by placing it in its context, if it's a blessing, it's grape juice. If it's a curse, it is alcoholic wine. Now, this is really something. Rabbi Dr. Isaacs said, in Jewish customs, we do not allow any alcoholic beverage at sacred rites or marriages. So what do we do? We boil the wine so that it is pure juice. Now that is important because Jesus, they say, created booze at the wedding in Cana. No, he didn't. If it's the Jewish custom to boil it for sacred events and marriages, so they have just the sweet juice, that's what I believe Christ created. First of all, it couldn't have fermented. It was presto whipto. All right? But Jesus, when he made it, had the imbibers say, Oh, you have kept the good wine until now. Why? Pure juice. They didn't use alcoholic beverages at weddings. Now, in John 10, verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The Greek there is the shepherd without corruption, without sin. Fermentation of booze is corruption. Now, 
in John 2.10 where he said, you've kept the good wine until now. It's the same as good shepherd, without corruption, without spoilage, without fermentation. Now, this is really interesting and it fits in with what Jesus did. There is another word in the Greek, tarash. It is found 38 times in the Word of God, always translated as wine. But it is really new wine or grape juice. You know, Rex Ella, we went to the Holy Land and we took a group, a huge group. Another prophecy minister also took a huge group. We had the same travel guide. As we're returning home, they said, because you brought so many, we're going to upgrade you. I never fly first class. I try to protect God's money. But they said, it's a gift because of what you've done. Sit in first class. Well, we had these chairs facing one another and this prophetical man who's so well known sat across from me and the stewardess came by with champagne bottles and she said would you like one sir he says oh yes ma'am i got infuriated righteous indignation she said how Uh, about you sir i said no ma'am i'm a born again christian uh, boy did he flee with his bottle that's what's going on in christianity today rexel and i oftentimes are not invited to meetings where we speak because the crowd who invited us, ministers, want to have their booze. That's all right. I'm standing on the Word of God. Now, listen to this again. Rabbi Dr. Isaacs said, you take the two words from the Hebrew, yayin and the Greek oinus, and you know whether they're good or not simply by the context. I have a book out, Alcohol, the Beloved Enemy. I take every verse from Genesis to Revelation where the word wine appears and after it put fermented, unfermented, fermented, unfermented. Never once is a believer allowed to have the fermented beverage. He can have the pure juice. And like Rexel's article said, the pure juice now will do just as much for you as the booze. It'll help your heart and all the rest. But what does the Bible have to say about this now? Look, I'm not manufacturing these texts. Remember, the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1.21. The Holy Spirit moved them to write every book of the Bible, every word. Amen. Now, listen, Leviticus 10, 9 and 10. Do not drink wine or strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, God's house, that you may put difference between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean. What's holy and clean? God's house. What's unholy and unclean? The booze. You don't take it when you go into God's house. And that reminds me of these communion services where they use a fermented beverage. I'm opposed to it. I went to a church here where one of my professors who taught me was there as the pastor. And at communion time, he said, we have two lines here. This one is with the alcoholic beverage. This one is pure juice. I walked out. I wouldn't be around a church like that for five minutes. Now, I know I'm going to make some of you mad, but when the Bible says don't drink wine or strong drink when you go into God's house, it means what it says. Now, do you know in communion they take unleavened bread because leaven is a fermentation process? But they'll take the bread that's unfermented and take fermented juice with it. It is not right. Now, why? Proverbs 20, verse 1. Now, these words have to do with the wine. Remember that. Wine was called grape juice, grape jelly, grape jam, raisins, grapes, all the rest. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Where is that again? Proverbs 20, verse 1. Proverbs 23, 29. Who hath woe, who hath sorrows, who hath contentions, who hath babblings, who hath wounds without cause, who hath blurry bloodshot eyes, they that carry long at the wine. You don't get that from grape juice. 
listen, Proverbs 23, 31, don't look on the wine when it turns red and moves itself. Fermentation. You may look on the wine when it's juice because the juice was called wine. And oh, I like Proverbs 23, 20, be not among wine bibbers. That's when it's fermented. He didn't say, be not among jelly eaters. Now, did he? Right. <laughs> True. He talked about booze. Isaiah 5, 11, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink and continue until night, till wine and flame them, makes them drunken. Isaiah 5, 22, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength, to mingle these strong drinks. Habakkuk 2, 15, Do you serve it? A guy came up to me the other day in the restaurant, claims to be a born-again Christian. He said, oh, Dr. Van Iffy, I was just promoted. I'm going to become a bartender. I took his hand. I said, oh, congratulations. You've become a drug dealer. What? Oh. It's the number one drug in the United States of America, more than cocaine, more than marijuana, heroin, and all the rest. And all these titles are read. And yet the Christians do it. If you go to Iraq tonight, you cannot buy booze in any single Muslim store. You have to go to all the Christian stores. What is wrong with us? Three billion in religion who won't do it, and we do it, and we sit there with our little cocktail glass and think it's all right. Now listen, if you're serving this, Habakkuk 2.15, Woe unto him that gives his neighbor drink and puts the bottle to him and makes him drunken. Puts the bottle to him, serves him. We need to be a different people. And I'll tell you, I stand upon the Word of God. Now, what's the consequences here? You are to abstain from all appearance of evil. But 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10 state, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not, shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Drunkards? You don't get that from grape juice. Galatians 5, 19. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And it mentions a whole slew of sins. Number 16 in that number is drunkenness. And Paul adds in verse 21, Of the which I told you before, so tell I now you again, that they which do these sins, including drunkenness, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We could go on and on. I think I've said enough. All that scripture. And yet some people will say, I don't care what God said, I want it. Because God, as I said, didn't give us a commandment to make us unhappy. But the Lord knows that some people will become alcoholics. Alcoholics, drug addiction cannot get you into heaven. I want to just uh, get a little personal here. Jack was reared in the home of an alcoholic. This is very, very potent to his heart. And Jack, unhappiness comes out of an alcoholic home, doesn't it? Abuse and all the rest. I came out of a European family, Belgians, and we were allowed to have booze right at the table, liquor. I got drunk twice before I was 12 years of age from my father's own liquor. And then the Lord Jesus saved dad, saved mother, and saved me. And the night my father received Christ as a savior, he cleaned out the pantry, all the liquor, everything you can imagine, the beer bottles, the wine, the culvert whiskey, took it to the alley, smashed it. And he was never the same again. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Second Corinthians 5.17. Thank you so much, Jack, for sharing that. You know, when Jack's dad, Oscar Van Impey, picked up that first bottle of wine when he was in Belgium as a little boy, he never planned on being an alcoholic. So you never know. Be very, very careful. In fact, let me say once again, just say no to the first bottle. All right, let's go on to another huge addiction. And you'll not be surprised at the one that we have chosen for this next one. Pornography. Pornography. I'm going to ask Jack if we can go back and forth here. I'm going to read a statement, then he can give me some Bible verses. He's never lacking for Bible verses because he's memorized about 15,000 Bible verses. And I'm so glad that we can back everything that we say today 
with the Bible, what God says about these things. We all have a view, we all have an opinion, but it's what God says that truly, truly matters. So let's go back and forth here, okay, okay. Jay? First of all, let me say this though, Rexella, 55% of the hotels and motels across America say that 55% of all the movies that they choose in these places are sexual. All the other movies only get 45%. They say that 45% of all men who are into this do it right on the job and 40% of them do it at home. And in California alone, last year they made 11 thousand sex films and only 500 regular movies. Think of that. America is the pornography distributing point for the world. A lot of child porn comes out of Denmark and Sweden, but they don't have anything that compares to our production and distribution. What a shame. And the Word of God, Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations who forget God. America is the worst in the world now. This is the point where it's distributed globally. That's why we preachers need to take a stand. Second Timothy 4 verses 2 to 4, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, when they like it and don't like it. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves teachers, preachers who tickle their ears. And that's what's happening now. Preacher, get a backbone and start preaching the word. Well, the porn industry employs an excess of 12,000 people in one state, California. In California alone, the porn industry pays over 36 million in taxes every single year. That's pretty astounding, Jack. I'm gonna tell you something. A few years ago, there was a horrendous earthquake in Northridge in the San Fernando Valley. It was one of the worst ever, but what most people didn't know is that that was the very area that makes most of the sex movies for the world and God was speaking, God was judging. And I'll tell you, there better be a change in California and America. And that's why Isaiah 58 one says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and sins. All right, U.S. sex industry breakdown, and this was for 2006. Video sales and rentals, 3.62 billion. Internet, 2.84 billion. Cable, 2.19 billion. Exotic dancing clubs, 2 billion. Novelties, 1.73 billion. Magazines, 0.95 billion total. 13.3 billion, and let me go on with this next astounding statistic. 60% of all website visits are sexual in nature, and too bad. So many children are tuning those in at home, Jack. And we're going to pay for it, and you remember this, be sure your sin will find you out, Numbers 32, 23, either here or when you meet God. But this is one of the signs that Christ is coming. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 37, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. How was it in Noah's day? Genesis chapter 6. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Verse 5, every imagination of the thoughts of men's minds was only evil continually. All they could think of was sex and more sex. Verse 10, the whole world was corrupt. Verse 12, all flesh upon the earth had corrupted his ways before God. And what's the result? Genesis 7:22. all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died through that horrendous flood. You can't get away with sin forever. 72 million, the approximate number of visitors to adult websites in 2006 per month, worldwide per month. 
Jesus said, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart, Matthew 5, 28. You're going to pay for all of this filthiness. The Bible says, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. If you're a Christian, why don't you get right with God? Repent and say, I'm through with this filthiness. 39 million homes receive the adult channels in scramble form, while the number of children with potential exposure to such images is about 29 million, and it is growing. I mentioned that a moment ago. Children watching pornography in their own home. In James chapter 1, verse 13 and onward, it says, No man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. But every man, when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, is guilty. And what happens? Lust, when it hath conceived, bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's the second death as well. Eternal separation from God. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Customs Service estimates that there are more than 100,000 websites, more than that now, offering child pornography. Did you know that it's illegal world? wide, illegal. They're doing it anyway, Jack. Oh, and Jesus was angry with those who mistreated children in his day. He said in Mark 9, verse 42, Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the depths of the sea. You say Jesus didn't believe in capital punishment. He said, for these who were child molesters, it would be good if you put a millstone around their neck weighing 100 pounds and drop them in the ocean. They won't come up for air, so that must be capital punishment. Does pornography enter into the life of Christians? I think this is going to astound you. And when Jack gave me this statistic, it startled me. Promise Keepers, you know that good organization that dealt with men across the country helping them with problems? Promise Keepers survey at one of their stadium events revealed that over 50% of the men in attendance were involved with pornography within one week of attending the event. Oh my, I know God wants them to be out of that jack. He'll help them. You know how? Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, Ephesians 6, 11. That's the book. And Galatians 5, 16 says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And not only men, but women have a real struggle with this also. August 7th, 2006, this survey was taken. 50% of all Christian men and 20% of all Christian women were addicted to pornography. 60% of the women who answered the survey admitted to having significant struggles with lust. 40% admitted to being involved in sexual sin in the past year. And 20% of the church-going participants struggle with looking at pornography on an ongoing basis. Oh, you know, th no wonder we need to have our pastors, our priests, rabbis getting up and helping their, their parishioners and saying, this is what God wants in your life. Jack, you are right on. You wonder how I get so much out of the Word of God? Well, I've memorized it. 2 Peter 2, 14, they have eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. And here's a warning. 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of God the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lusts thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. You know, Jack, I just said that was a survey of 2006. It's growing. You know, if it's a year old, it's growing every single day. Here's one from March 2007. One third of 13-year-old boys in Alberta, Canada, admitted to viewing porn. 13 years old. Jack, what young children are watching this? David, one day he was standing on his rooftop and he saw a young lady in her courtyard taking a shower. That nudity got to him. Lust 
overwhelmed him. And soon he fell into sin. Oh, I'll tell you how he repented. There are eight Psalms called penitential that he wrote because he did nothing but weep over his sin. And after getting right with God, he could say in Psalm 101, verse 3, and this is good for the young, the old, the men, the women, listen to him, I will set no evil thing before my eyes. Amen. Well, uh, you know, Jack is quite a student of Bible prophecy. If you watch Jack and if he presents in your home, you know that he, that's his love. He loves Bible prophecy. And I would ask him, is all of the uh, things that we've been discussing here today, alcoholism and now pornography, is that a part of Bible prophecy, Jack? Oh, definitely is sex addiction. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 12, just before I return, iniquity shall abound. Second Timothy 3.13, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We already quoted this verse earlier. It's the tribulation hour and Revelation 9.21 says they would not repent of their sexual addictions. It's going to get worse. You know, Jack, if it points to the coming of the Lord, we better really get our hearts right. If He were to come today, would you be ashamed or would you say, Oh, Lord, I'm so glad you're here. I have nothing to hide. I don't have to turn off that pornography. I'm not going to watch it anymore. Oh, how we need to be right. Well, where does it all lead to? All the pornography and, and the addiction to it. Well, it does lead to a sexual addiction. Take a look at this. Tomorrow's World, America's Moral Meltdown from Newsweek, The Girls Gone Wild Effect. And of course, we know who they are. Degrading tunes steer teenagers towards sex. This study says teens who say they listen to lots of music with degrading sexual messages are almost twice as likely to start having sexual activity within two years. And in-flight sexual activity prompts federal charges. A California couple is facing federal charges after allegedly refusing to stop some sexual activity on a flight to Raleigh. An untold crime, oh, this really hurts my heart. Reports of boys being molested by women on the rise. And this woman, oh, had a sexual affair. She was 41 years old with a 15 year old boy. And the judge weighs deal with Tampa teacher student sex case. Now, we all know that there have been some teachers who have been involved sexually with some of their students. Flavor Flav, yes to children, no to getting married. Too bad. Out of wedlock births at high. Rise in Alberta syphilis cases shows a downside of the boom. And again, I want to emphasize this is not just in the U.S., it's worldwide. Gonorrhea joins list of resistant superbugs. Strained spouses, straight or gay, can spread STD. And 40 million have the virus, 2 million get the treatment. Routine HIV testing is urged. More sex offenders tracked by satellite. Now, let me just say this, friends. As I mentioned, it is worldwide. I have more statistics, of course, from the United States than around the world. But no matter where you go in the world, you find sexual addiction everywhere. Jack, I'm going to ask, you gave us some verses a moment ago. Uh, can you give us some more verses, not just pertaining to prophecy, but sexual addiction? Really can, Rexella. As I said, 11 million are living together without a marriage license, and this is shocking. We used this recently on television. This lady will not use her name, says, I love your show, and your research and preaching is incredible. I talked to my preacher about an unusual situation. My children's father and I have been living together. He told me, don't worry about it. The world has changed and you will go to heaven. She says, can you imagine? My preacher would tell me that. She says, I'm glad I followed what you told me to do and made it right with God. Mm -hmm. You see, Hebrews 13 verse 4 says, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled in marriage, but outside of marriage, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. 
Now, these one night stands, these living relationships are totally against the word of God. Do you know this book uses wife and wives 540 times and you can't be a wife or one of the wives unless you're married. That's how important it is to God, 540 times. Now, I'm going to shock some of you. Some of you have had relationships with many. There were two major universities right in our town that recently said some of the girls have three partners per month. It's a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Ephesians 5 verse 12. Now, this is shocking. In 1 Corinthians 6 15, he says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot, a street walking prostitute? God forbid. And so in verse 18, he says, Flee this fornication with prostitutes, with harlots, one night stands, and all the rest. Because every time you do it, you become one flesh with that individual. Imagine having three different ones in one month who become one flesh with you. And that's what the Bible teaches. Because of it, he says in 1 Corinthians 7, as we continue, verses 1 and 2, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, to avoid fornication, the sex between the unmarried. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. And you know, I'm so sick about some of these athletes and some of them boasting about they've had a hundred different women. What a mess they're going to meet when they see God at the judgment day, unless they repent of their sins. And they fulfill Ephesians 4, 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all sexual uncleanness with greediness. Wow. What happens to these people? 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, sex, sin between the unmarried, or idolaters, or adulterers, one of them's at least married, or the effeminate, the abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And then he gets to verse 21 after mentioning many other sins. Of the which I tell you before, so I tell you now once again that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 8, Revelation 21, 8, and Revelation 22, 15. You're going to be sad when you come to the end of the road. But isn't it good that in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, where he mentions the 10 groups, including those who fool around with fornication and adultery, you have a hope. Because in verse 11, he says, such were some of you, but you are washed. Oh, I love what the blood of Christ can do. Cleanse us from all sin, 1 John 1, 7. And I love that old hymn we used to sing, Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? You can become clean today if you'll pray the prayer with me just a little later in the program. Jack, there's nothing that we can do or want to do or maybe we will do that the Lord will not forgive, right? Oh, that's right. I love the way you're bringing that in. Yeah. All through this video, you know, he's been bringing in how that the Lord wants to redeem you and bring you out of that addiction, that addiction that binds you. You don't want to be in there. Even when you come to the last <clears throat> two verses of the Bible, he says, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. Let him that a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Look at Revelation 22, verses 17 and on. I'm going to give you a statistic here that absolutely boggles my mind. The latest statistics on gambling in America are chilling. We legally wager more money annually than we spend on groceries. $500 billion through gambling. Let me go on here and we'll give you some more statistics. Gamblers get a high from the adrenaline produced by their bodies while in action. The larger the risk, the greater the amount. According to the American National Institute of Mental Health, gambling is the fastest growing addiction 
among high school and college students. It's the Teen Vice of the 90s and it is growing especially now that we have gone into the 2000s. The lottery is the game of choice for countless low-income Americans who can't afford trips to the casino. As nearly half of the sales are made to 5% of ticket buyers. Now, you know, friends, I want to show you a few things here. Here is a magazine that shows how that gambling can be obsessive. When gambling becomes obsessive, something that you cannot turn away from. Against the odds, gambling has become America's hot pastime. But today's casinos have more of an upper hand you cannot win. College kids caught in gambling madness. And greed, as I mentioned, these things are all worldwide. This addiction is in China, and it is one of the largest gambling uh, casinos in the world. Portuguese colony Macau is pulling in more money a month than any other gambling center in the world at $678 million for this past September. It was more than $23 million ahead of Las Vegas. And here is a picture of a man, the worst of the bets, and oh, bless his heart, he has come out of his gambling compulsion. At last, he says, I'm free. For millions, the thrill of the bet is as addictive as any drug. Scientists are beginning to figure out why and what can be done. Now, let me say there are some warning signs. If you love going to the casino, just look for a few of these warning signs. The need for gambling with increasing amounts of money. That's a warning sign. Also commits illegal acts such as fraud and theft in order to fulfill going to the gambling casinos. Feels shame and guilt and remorse after gambling. That's a sign. Many, many more that we could go into. Perhaps you're feeling some of these signs. You just can't help it. You're addicted to gambling. But uh, you know, they're getting help for that now, Jack. Rick, so I was amazed as we worked on this program together and found out that the term covetousness is in line with adultery. I mean, both are tie, hundreds of verses on both. And to be covetous is to desire another's possessions, his wealth, his riches. And that goes for those who are at the casinos, those who are always playing the lottery, uh, because they have a greedy graspiness for material things. And that's one of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's possessions. Oh, I wish I had his house. Oh, look at his wife. Oh, look what he's got in bank accounts. That's covetousness, and it is wrong. In Mark 7, 21 and 22, Jesus said, Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, thefts, and covetousness. Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, Beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Then in Hebrews 13, 5, he says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Now, here is the picture for all of us. In 1 Timothy 6, verses 7 to 11, it says, We brought nothing into this world, and we shall carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. For they that will be rich fall into a temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown a man in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money, the love of it is the root of all evil, while some who coveted after have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, man of God, flee these things. That's what's wrong with gambling. You want someone else's possessions. Remember this, you cannot win money unless some have lost money. And people have mortgaged their homes, sold them, lost their lives in this thing. Many have 
given up everything they have, their children, their marriages, all because of the gambling fever. And even if a little $2 lottery ticket for a Christian, it should not be. God is against covetous. Go back to your commandments. Thou shall not covet. Mm. So very well said, Jack, from the Bible again. We've covered uh, many addictions here already on this video, but I would like to add some addictions that sometimes do not surface. You know, you don't know that they're there until they dramatically seem to come out. And yet they're just as destructive, just as destructive as gambling or alcohol or some of the other things that we've been talking about today because they break God's will and His moral code just as, just as much as the others. Like hatred, people hate. And oh, how much God is against this. I want you to take a look at what hate will bring you to. A vile teen fad beating, the homeless across the nation, America's homeless are under attack. Literally, they are hunted down during youthful rites of passage by roving packs of mouths armed with prejudice and tools of torture. And you know, I can't believe that this one homeless man, these teenagers set ablaze in his wheelchair. Mm. U.S. jury convicts man of hate crimes. Salapek, ready for life term. He pleads uh, guilty to three killings. A horrible, horrible thing. Teen expected to plead guilty in mom's death. Here is a 16-year-old man and he stabbed his mother 111 times. School killings up, this study shows. Murders, robberies jump in the cities. Louisiana town reels from claim of 48 murders. Florida searches for root of surge in violent crimes. Hate, hate. You know, sometimes I can't get over it. Some of these murderers will do something and, and their neighbor will say, I can't believe that was him. He never showed anything like that. Even the mother and dad might say, that's not my son. I never noticed that. But in deep inside that person was that terrible hatred, perhaps for not only those around him, but for himself. Jack, I'm going to ask you a question here. Does the Bible, again, address hate? Oh, 1 John 3:15. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. And no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You don't have to put a bullet through a man's brain or put a dagger into his heart. It's hatred that makes people do these things and no murderer, just the one that has hate, has eternal life. But what about God's commandments? Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, Thou shalt not kill. This is interesting, Rexella. Any rabbi will tell you that the Hebrew there is not killed. We preachers have it all wrong. He said, thou shalt not murder. World of difference. Jesus had it right in Matthew 19, verse 18, when he said, thou shalt do no murder. Now, when one murders someone, what should happen to him? Oh, he declared incompetency, a mental disorder, bunk. He that smites a man shall be put to death. And that's Exodus 21, 12. 20, 13, don't murder, turn the page, put him to death. Leviticus 24, 17, he that killeth a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. Now, hatred is a terrible thing. And some of you church members, I say, boy, I'm a great Christian. I've really done well so far. I don't smoke, don't drink, don't use drugs, don't use pornography, but you hate everybody. That's going to get you just as lost as anything else. 1 John 2, 9 to 11. He that saith he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. 1 John 3, 10, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loves not his brother. 1 John 3, 14, We know not, hope so, guess so, think so, no, we've passed from death unto life because we love the brothers and sisters in Christ. 
man, some of you critics who are running around with a mean spirit, gossiping and tearing everyone down, you need an old-fashioned Holy Spirit-empowered revival in your heart, or you may miss heaven. Now, in 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. Hey, that's pretty plain, isn't it? And if you follow your Jesus, you'll know what love is. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, because you have love one for another, John 13, 35. And this is amazing. Oh, Luke 6, verses 27 and 28, Christ speaking, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. Rexella. 1 John 3.16, not the gospel, but the epistle in the back. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because God laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Oh, you see that kind of Christianity? Mm. Giving our life for another brother and sister in Christ, instead of having that vicious tongue, which we'll talk about in a minute, that castigates, vilifies, maligns everybody. You need revival. And you know, that's what causes all these wars. You know, Hitler hated the Jews, hated the Jews. And here we have people even in the same denominations who may hate each other, would want to kill them if they could. This is an awful thing. And if we follow the love of Christ, why we wouldn't have that problem. And I'm going to go on with something else. And this is getting pretty close to some of the homes. Jack, uh, there are uh, people out there, and I, we have to watch this so very, very much. An addiction to using our tongue in the wrong way. And you know what? It's called an uncontrollable tongue. And haven't you ever said something and you say, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I could take that back. An uncontrollable tongue. Okay, I'm going to deal with some things now that have to do with the tongue. And we need to examine our hearts on this, friends. I'm examining my heart. I trust that you will. Uncontrollable tongue includes gossip. Gossip, Jack. This is terrible. I heard about four ministers who decided to take a vacation together. And one night they said, you know, we all have problems. Let's confess our faults one to the other. And the one minister said, oh, I love to have a little bottle of beer when I get away from the congregation. The second one said, I like to smoke a good stogie, a big cigar. The third one said, I, I like to get a hold of one of these girly magazines. And the fourth one said, men, my sin is gossip and I can hardly wait till I get home. <laughs> oh. Oh. Watch out who you tell. <laughs> Rexella, I remember when we were in crusades, sometimes 10, 12,000 people sitting out there. And I had the anointing of the Lord on me and people would come to me and say, oh man, you've got the Holy Ghost. We can feel it. I said, yes. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. And I have been baptized by the Spirit. And they said, Well, have you had the gift? And I knew what they were going to say. The sign. And they were talking about tongues. I said, Well, there are 28 of them in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. Which one do you mean? They said, Speaking in tongues. I said, Oh, I'm looking for a greater sign. What's that? I said, Controlling the one I have. Oh, <laughs> how, how true. Listen true. to this. James yeah. 3, verse 2. If any man offend not in word or in tongue, the same is a perfect man. You can't get any better than perfect. Amen. But the book of James has to do with the tongue. In chapter 3, verse 6, he says, The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that because it defiles the whole body. When we get to verse 10, he says, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. If they are, what's wrong with the person? Chapter one, verse 26 of the book of James. It says, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his own tongue, he deceiveth himself and his religion is vain, meaningless. In Proverbs 6, 16 to 18, it mentions seven sins. God hates 
And one of them is a false witness that speaks lies and he that sows discord among the brethren. It's often been said, he that thinketh by the inch and speaketh by the yard ought to be kicked by the foot. <laughs> How true that How is. How true, yes. Out of the mouth and out of the heart proceed all these evil things that people say against one another. And it's not right. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be a kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, in G, for Jesus' sake, hath forgiven you. And, you know, I get tired of these church people who get on the phone. He says, Now, I'm not gossiping. I'm only telling you this story so that you might pray more intelligently. Oh, baloney. God give us people today who show love one for another. That's the word of God from cover to cover. Oh, Jack, we need to be watching the gossip, don't we? That is on God's mind and watch our tongues. Well, something else we need to watch the tongue for, and that is using God's name in vain. I've been with uh, Christians and all of a sudden it came out. And they say, oh, I'm sorry. Well, you know, you need to be sorry to the Lord because we need to watch never to take His name in vain. Jack, that is in the Bible, isn't it? And in some of your homes, this happens. Use the name of God and the name of Jesus in profanity. And Exodus chapter 20, verse 7 says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You will stand guilty before God for doing this. And Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Rick Sella, one thing that really bothers me today, you go to a movie and you think you're going to be inspired. And we went recently and within the first 10 minutes, the name of God, the name of Jesus, the F word, never, we get up and walk out and I demand my money back when they say, why? I say, because I'm a Christian and they're breaking God's commandments in that filthy, dirty, rotten, stinking movie and I'm not going to support it. And you Christians who can sit in those places and hear your God blasphemed over and over and over, I fear your salvation. I mean it. If you love Jesus, how can you sit there and hear that precious name dragged through the mire in the name of God the Father? Also, in Webster's International Dictionary, they have euphemisms for the name of God and Jesus. And you know, a lot of you people think nothing of this. I used to think this was a ridiculous thing, but it's in the dictionary. G, G's, G whiz. Abbreviations for the precious name of Jesus. Gosh, darn, darn it. Abbreviations for the name of God and damn it. I'm just telling you what it is. And when you say gosh darn, according to Webster's Dictionary, that's risque. We need to clean up our language. We need to be a different people. I hear some of these guys on TV preaching and they'll say, oh my God. And they're not saying it in a context where there's a love for God. It's wrong. They're using God's name in vain and holy and reverent is his name. Let's respect it. That's why I don't just say Jesus. I say the Lord Jesus Christ. I honor my Savior. Something else we're going to mention here, and I believe the Bible also refers to it. Uh, that's dirty jokes. You know, dirty jesting. Uh, Jack, uh, you're very sensitive about that also. Oh. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Ephesians 5, 4, fornication and all uncleanness, not, not once be named among you that becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish jesting, coarse jesting, or all of these ungracious things. For this you know that no whoremonger or unclean person or a covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Let no man deceive you, for because of these things, the filthy language, all the dirty jokes, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. Mm. Something that I was just thinking about going into this next word was when I was a little girl and my mother told me not to lie, always tell the truth. You know, it's so easy that mom would say, honey, did you do that? No, mama, I didn't do that, no. It's so easy, isn't it? 
to tell a little what we call white lie. Uh, Jack, uh, and it also includes something else too when we lie. Wicked imaginations. We think something about somebody and then we lie about them. Well, that's one of the time. things God hates in Proverbs 6, 16, 18. Wicked imaginations. You imagine this and you tell the story and it isn't true. But let's get back to the other for a moment. You know why children do that? Psalm 58, 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. We go astray as soon as we be born speaking lies. And I'll tell you, honey, I've been in this work a long time. And I've worked with 10,000 preachers. And it's so easy for preachers to tell a lie. I've been in their offices. And they didn't think anything of it when I was listening. And the secretary would say, so and so is calling. And the minister would say, tell him I'm out. You'll never have that happen at Jack Van Impey Ministries, I promise you. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't put my people under that and then stand in front of them and try to preach with a good conscience. These men have become hardened in their hearts. And lying is a terrible thing. And Ephesians 4.25 says, put away lying. You know, they call these ivories. And sometimes they become poison ivories. Ah, all right. <laughs> but Revelation 21, 8, the fearful and unbelieving and abominable whoremongers and murderers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Revelation 22, 15, for outside of heaven are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I'll tell you, when you get through with this video, some of you need to fall on your knees and repent, ministers included. Mm, yes, well, I'm examining my heart. How about you? We all need to be saying, oh Lord, fill me with your spirit and help me to overcome that weakness in my life. I don't want it to become something that I cannot overcome. Um, I'm going to hit one more thing here before we ask Jack how to really help us to say the prayer that we need to pray. And that is pride. God not only does not dislike it, God hates it. You know, there's a, there's a little saying that I heard once, there's a difference of being proud of an accomplishment and of saying, look what I did. How true we need to give God all the glory when we have a success in this life and give praise to Him. And, you know, sometimes the things that are going on around the world in politics, it's pride. They want to be number one. They want to be voted in. It's because of who I am that they want to be in that position. You know, Jack, God hates pride. He does, Rexella. I heard about a minister who wrote a book entitled Humility and How I Obtained It. And he said, you know it's the greatest <laughs> book on the market right now. Oh, yes. <laughs> I met some of them like that, honey. These six things doth God hate. Number one, a proud look. Proverbs 6, 16. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I heard about this little frog who was watching the eagles float through the air with amazing ease. He said, oh, if only I could fly, if only I could do that. The eagles landed and the frog crawled over to where they were and he said, oh, would you two birds do me a favor? He says, here's a stick. Would each one of you take part of it in your bill and then fly through the air and I'll be fastened to the middle of the stick. They said, sure. He grabbed it with his teeth. They flew through the air. And as they're floating, the frog is having the greatest of times. And someone said on the ground, oh, man, that is marvelous. I wonder who thought of that. He says, I did. Whoa. <laughs> Splat. <laughs> right. Pride Aww. go before destruction. Rexella, that was Satan's sin. He was the anointed cherub that covereth in heaven when he was Lucifer. This is what happened one day. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. How art thou fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which this week in the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation, God's throne in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of heaven. I, I, I will be like the most high God. And 
he was cast out of the third heaven with his angels. Revelation 12, verse 7. Pride can be a terrible thing. And today, in 1 Timothy 3, 6, it says, A minister should not be a novice, a new convert. Why? Lest being filled with pride, he falls into the same condemnation into which Satan fell. Watch your life. Watch your walk. Oh, yes. Watch our walk. Well, you know, none of us are perfect, are we? And that's why we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, and we have prayer, and we can say every day, Lord, I'm sorry, that's all it takes. Lord, I'm sorry, help me to begin anew with you. I want to encourage your heart with a letter uh, very quickly here at the end of this video. I think it's going to encourage some of you. It's from a lady from Houston. She said she's been wanting to write us for some time and tell us what God had done in her life. She was a drug addict at age 14 and she married a wonderful, loving, successful man and they had a handsome, intelligent son. And I had all material things I ever wanted or needed, plus a loving family. But every day my alcoholism and addiction worsened. In 1996, disaster struck our son, only 11 years old, was diagnosed with leukemia and died just eight months later. My indifference to God turned into hate and rage. I swore I'd become an atheist and vowed never again to waste one word in prayer. As obvious, in my opinion, God had ignored my pleas for a miracle to cure my son of leukemia that he might live. Meanwhile, my addictions sharpened and accelerated, and I tried to deprive myself of some things so that I could have my cocaine. Sometime in 2002, I was again up all night injecting cocaine, drinking alcohol, and watching TV. Suddenly, on one channel, a vivid, beautiful earth appeared, and I stared at it, remembering what the world had looked like some time ago instead of this dark and lonely hell it had become. Then the two of you came on the screen, so full of love and life and laughter and light, and I knew I wanted what the two of you had. I had already been to treatment for my addiction three times and was reluctant to return. I hardened my heart against your message that night and for months afterwards, but still I made sure to watch you every week. Gradually I came to understand that God loves me no matter what I had said or done and my anger began to fade. At last I realized that God had indeed not only heard my prayers but answered them. My son has been cured of leukemia and he does live with God. This was the miracle I'd ask of the Lord years ago. And on October the 2nd, 2002, I had my last drink and drug. I went back to treatment and I've been sober ever since. I turned my life over uh, to the Lord and I'm securing His love, mercy, and forgiveness. Now I am a happy, fulfilled woman in Christ. And you know, I want to encourage you, friends, with something that she said there. Sometimes after you accept the Lord, you do need some extra treatment like AA. It's good because they refer to God very often in their treatments. Or go to your pastor, go to a Christian psychologist or psychiatrist. She said another thing that we all need to do. I read my Bible and your books and watch your DVDs. I no longer fear death as I know I will be forever reunited with the Lord and my family in Christ instead of being forever separated from them. Oh, Jack, oh, that moves my heart. Yes, yeah. I feel like weeping too. What a blessing. And we get letters by the hundreds and so many of them have been delivered from alcohol and drugs and sex and the rest. Praise the Lord. Now look, do you want to be delivered? The blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. I don't care what you've done, how often you've done it, how hideous, heinous your sin seems in your own eyes. God will save you right now. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a bargain? 
then he doesn't ever remember it again according to this word. You'll never have to face it if you put it on him now, saying, I'm sorry. Pray this prayer after me from your heart. Oh, precious Lord Jesus, Savior of the world, you died for me. You love me and gave yourself for me personally. And now you ask me to lay my sins upon you. Name your sin right now. Go ahead to God. He hears you. Say, I want to be delivered. Lord, I want to be saved. I want to be with you, Jesus, forever. You're coming soon. So pray this now from all your heart. I receive you this day, Jesus, as my own personal Savior. Come into my heart. Save me. And deliver me from this addiction I have. I believe in the power of your blood shed at Calvary for me. Cleanse me today. Save me. Pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Isn't it good to know that it really works? It works. You don't have to know theology from beginning to end. All you have to do is to believe on the Lord Jesus and receive him into your heart. If you prayed that prayer with Jack, please write to me. I want to thank Kay in Houston for writing that letter. I'm so glad that we went on late night, Kay. I'm so glad that we're on late night all across America and Canada. We're reaching people who are on drugs and alcohol, those who are addicted. And if you're addicted, you can be delivered, just like Kay. You can be delivered if only you'll ask Christ into your heart. And if you did make that decision, please write to me. I'll send you absolutely free. I say this over and over on our program. First steps in a new direction. Do you want to walk in that new direction? The Lord will walk with you because he loves you. He'll deliver you. You can have a new life and not be afraid of tomorrow. Uh, so often I give on our program a little statement at the end, a thought for the day, if you will. And I want to close this video with a thought. The best reason for doing right today is tomorrow. I trust that you'll lay that aside, whatever it is, and walk with the Lord and have a happy life. God bless you. We'll look for you on our program. We'll come into your home perhaps this coming week. And until then, remember, God loves you. He cares for you. So do we. Bye-bye.